All right, hello everyone and welcome to Core Academy. Um, I'm gonna be continuing talking about um, the same thing I did on Tuesday. We're gonna be talking about beginner Lua. So if you are just starting to try scripting in Core, if you are kind of at the beginning of that journey, boy, do I have a stream for you. If you're super experienced at it, you might still get something out of it because I do have some tips and tricks. Um, but mostly we're gonna be talking about core and the core API and a little bit of abstract look at what this class model, what these core objects are that we talk about. So when we talk about like abilities and players and triggers and all of these different things that are in the core game that we add, we can drag and drop through the editor. They also have a sort of programming interface. Um, and they are core objects, or they're all sort of variations, children of core objects. Um, and we're going to talk about what that means, and we're going to make you really good at reading the API and understanding what's going on there. So that is, hello, Mr. Isaacs. Nice to see you. And speaking of which, plug Tuesday. Um, I have the regular stream at 11 a.m. Pacific time and at 6 a.m. Pacific time, that's 9 a.m. Eastern, I will be doing the same topic. We're going to be doing an intro to Lua, so it's going to look a little bit like Tuesday, where you need zero experience required. Welcome to Lua. You can do it, and we can teach you. So that is Tuesday at 6 a.m. on Mr. Isaac's Twitter, which I'm going to link now, or not Twitter, sorry, on their Twitch, which I'm going to link now. Hang on. Um, uh, here we go. Is inside participate. Um, where, boom, linked, where you can... Um, you can also on, it's app.participate, I need to get the, I'm going to just send you the link to the Core Academy one because that is the one that I always go to. Um, but you can also participate in, haha, participate, you see, see what's happening there, in a discussion about the Core Intro to Game Design course. So it's a really conceptual course about like what makes good games. Like how do you take an idea and really think about what it would mean for somebody else to play it and then build it so that somebody else would want to play it. And that's all discussed in this course. And and that, well, that's all written about in this course. Then the discussion is happening here at participate.com. Um, and that is where we can talk about, um, they're posting different lessons as like subjects and we can read them, kind of book group it. It's like a book group where the book is like, you know, a couple of paragraphs long. So you can get right in there. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did participate. I, you know what? Now that I'm trying, I can't do it. But uh, yeah, it's a really cool opportunity. It's a really good community to really get a discussion going and not just feel like you're kind of creating in a void. So you should definitely check it out. Yes, the Lua course is coming. It's a little bit delayed, so it's going to be coming next month, and I don't know a final date yet. But there is going to be a Core Academy Lua course. We have it all, like, scaffolded out. We know what it's going to look like. It's going to be beautiful. Oh, oh, I cannot wait. Um, teaching programming is, like, my life's passion in work so getting to do it in the context of making games in core which is just like I don't know it's just like hard not to do something beautiful in core I was looking at a game today that somebody made that a group made um in that like takes place in this greenhouse with like plants and like little potted things and you're this like dusty fox and it was just like it was just like it made my brain sparkle it was so beautiful um so yeah so there's just like you combo the core with this which like with this lua which is you know like learning the language itself i can teach you that very quickly we can get there and then learning how to do it in core is probably like one step past there so we're gonna have like a really comprehensive course that'll just like walk you through so that by the end you will be like i grok lua and core and using them together but I can get you started right now. And that's what we're doing today is we're going to kind of skip over some of the stuff that I did on Tuesday where I talked about the really fundamentals. And we're going to just talk about the core API and how to read our core API documentation. Um, and to do that, we must understand the game object. Okay, so uh, let me let's see. I just kind of want a writing service right now. Um, uh, 
sorry guys let's hide that get a little bit better screen there oh so much better much better boom all right, it's kind of cutting me off at the bottom here. Um, but uh, let's see, I'm in Core Academy right now. And I'm actually going to start just like a new empty project so we can kind of start from, yeah, I'm going to save my changes. I accidentally, I broke Core Academy. I was trying to mess with the lighting and I had forgotten that I do this kind of trick to get these very light colors where I'll, I'll boost colors, which means that a bunch of stuff in Core Academy secretly glows in the dark. And I had forgotten about that because the lighting has always been chill. So you didn't notice. Um, but, uh, yeah, it did. Okay. So welcome to blank empty project. Um, I'm not modeling anything, so I may get rid of these squares. It just drives me crazy. Um, oh yeah. You know what we can do? We can just take like a brief interlude to look at some new materials. Cause I'm really excited about one of them that I was going to show you in court Academy because materials, materiales, Aye, here they are. Okay, uh, which is that there are some new, um, like, fantasy. I wonder if we can sort them by theme. Um, no. Okay, well, there's a new uh, bookshelf um, object. So let's just, like, grab a cube. No, core content, cube. Um, which I had seen, um, Big Ol' Buns do basically like a workaround for Bookshelf where he had changed like a striped texture to look booky-ish. Will it be possible to add anime characters? Um, are we talking about like not like Nalu here? Or are you talking like 2D? Um, because adding is sort of like a hard thing. There's a lot of customization possible, so like, um... You guys just want to see this is brief, vaguely related to what we we're going to talk about today. But um, so these no, he's not the one I want. Where are you? Yeah, ponytail. All right. So ponytail over here. Yeah, this is this is always the problem I have is that when I'm working, I don't actually like the level of shadow. It makes for a really realistic space, but it does not. Um, it doesn't really like create like the environment that I want, which is um, really like I can see everything from everywhere. So you can see like instantly I made this look less realistic. I look like, you know, wherever flow lives. Um, it's very just like, you know, where is the light even coming from? But it's really easy to see things. So when you're demonstrating things, it's nice to have. So anyway, with these animated meshes, you can customize a lot about them. So one of the things that I've been enjoying is I'm going to create a new custom material. So this is his face. So this color right here is his hair. And you can kind of tell, like, if I make it, like, bright green that um let's see if we can even see the bright green yeah so that it's sort of like layered on this really dark tone so you get this like highlight actually that's like super the jokery there's definitely something you could do there mission to all of you out there um yes dirt magician making armors gives you so many more options um but yeah so mission to somebody out there this is my call make me a joker character make them kind of crazy we could probably so you can actually add decals let's try that um two animated meshes uh de decals where are you decals mm, it's above materials is the answer to that question so let's see if we can't i don't want like a scorch mark i want like uh like elven symbols or something like that so i could do that and uh, all right i made it disappear shrink it down so that we get some like sort of like face scar thing i don't know the point of the story is that there's lots of like awesome things you can do and one of the things i figured out and this is with overloading colors and we really need documentation on it it's coming i promise we're not there yet is this v stands for value um so and if i slide this around it pretty much if i slide this around boop it goes from zero to one you can say zero is black and one is basically the brightest version of the color you can over i'm gonna say overload it i'm never sure so i'm gonna make this five um and that is basically what makes it glow the thing i was talking about earlier about how i accidentally made hey nizul um made core academy glow is basically doing this um so if i make this five you get this thing and it looks like a gradient it's not it's just like the color picker's way of saying like it's a glowy blue though it's like blue but it's like emitting extra light right it's neon blue um so i do that and then boom it actually gets basically what it does is now it kind of overrides that black so i'm really getting the color i wanted um and so that is how i would make a blue haired animated mesh and end of tutorial you're welcome goodbye
No, I'm just kidding. Um, overdrive, overdrive. Yeah, it's. I used to when I was teaching programming, I would get in trouble swapping um, overwrite, override, and overload, which are all sort of very specific different things you do with functions. Um, and um, yeah, I think overdrive is is right, and also it sounds kind of dope. So we're gonna go with that. We overdrove the color so that it overrided the thing. And I've done. I'll show you another example. Uh, with a material which is like wood forest floor have you guys ever seen this one I love it because it's all like viney and ridiculous but if you try to let's see we can close this guy out um, boop do 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 default floor here it is okay so if I try to change mm, all right um, I didn't want to go that far away I'm sorry all right so if I try to change the floor oh I have properties in a weird place right now sorry guys I'm been experimenting a lot with layout I do a lot of times have core in like half a screen because I'm like also writing about it next to that and uh, that is why I have weird layouts all the time so if you try to change the color on this um, if you select it and then try to change the color like this is white so if I add like let's even try a light like say a, like a light pink right it adds like a tint to it but it's actually darker like there's nothing I can do that makes it lighter so if I really wanted it to be weirdo pink I override it like this boom so now I've got again looks like gradient is neon because we over drove it overdrived it I don't know um linguistics but now you can see that I still kind of keep that green because there's like really like tons of different colors going on here but I can actually make it a lot lighter so let's say we did just a straight I think this works I do like five here you'll have to believe all right that's really light we've still got the green there's not like a lot I can do it besides I think if I now see yeah even as a custom material it really doesn't let it doesn't let me change this green um, but you know you can see we could do that and then probably play with the sky dome color so let's see here not cloud no I don't want sky dome I want sky light so if I take that and I made it like really pink you can see there's like a couple of ways I could basically set this up let's see what do I want I want kind of like the opposite it would be sort of a purple to try to take the blue out no, that actually didn't help at all. Okay. Um, anyway, the point of the story is there's more ways to mess with materials, even if they're sort of like intended to be used a certain way. And I hope I don't get in trouble for that. But um, yeah, mess with things. Be free. Um, and this is a little blinding. So we're going to... Uh, we're going to change the material on that to the old trusty asphalt. Boom. Look at that. Oh, it's still got the override color, so it really looks like concrete, kind of. Um, so this is, yeah, let's look at, um, we can check this out and see that it still has the color override. Right, we overdrove the override. Boom. Got it together. So if I take this back, boom. Now that's this, this is what we expect asphalt to look like. And I don't know, I find something comforting about this. I think it's kind of like, it looks very much like a real floor, so I start feeling like I'm in a place. Okay. So what we wanted to talk about today is a core object. Um, and um, core object talk, I, I don't know. So this is actually a funny thing I do um, that you don't have to, but um, I will actually use a script to like plan a project sometimes. So what you can do is if you do dash, dash, dot dot this is this double bracket thing is actually how lua does a multi-line string which i've never talked about um but um so actually i'm just so i'm just gonna talk about it for a second if i say var uh my name equals and i'll say slinky slinkus right now let's say i want to say var my okay i need something less personal than my address but that makes sense on multiple lines um and isn't ascii art because that's hard but let's say okay so var um uh list of ah here we go favorite things but we're not going to make it a table which would make much more sense equals um or to-do list that's really what i'm trying to explain to you guys right now so to do list i use this double bracket here and then i can actually just be like a thing 
Oh, I probably should not use quotes though. Um, so yeah, so this is all inside here. So I'll be like, make core academy, teach Lua, learn more things, right? Okay, so this is a list. And if I take this, right, basically what it has done is it has the strings, all of these characters, and it has this character coming after all of these called a new line. Um, and so if I say print to do list, we can save that and press play. And it does not like, all right, I did something wrong there. Um, okay, let's just, uh, mm, is it a quote? Multi, mm, mm. sorry guys. Uh, yeah, it, this should work just fine. Did I add quotes in here somehow? Is it an escape sequence? All right, all right, I, I don't know exactly why it doesn't like this, but this isn't that useful, aside from that you can do multi, mm, multi-line comments this way, where now, mm, Am I messing this up? I may have to pull out another thing. There's something I'm doing wrong about this. Uh, this looks exactly right. I don't know. Is it the space there? Is that the issue? Aha! Okay, cool. So now what I can do is I can write a bunch here, which was literally the whole goal of this, uh, was to be able to just like tell you about things. Okay, so basic types um in lua r right strings we've seen numbers which we kind of understand as ints and floats which are the decimal numbers and ints are the non-decimal numbers um and booleans which i'm okay it's capital b boolean because it's named after a guy named boolean oh did i say var ah. <laughs> thank you nizol <laughs> That was the problem the whole time. I'm sorry, guys. My background is in JavaScript, so I fall back on it sometimes when I'm in autopilot, which I was. Um, yes. So that is what's happened there. If you ever see me throw a random semicolon at the end of things, Lua doesn't actually apparently complain if you do that, but that is where that habit came from for me. Um... But yeah, so we got strings, numbers, and booleans. That's it. Everything that it saves comes down to strings, numbers, and booleans. And you're like, okay, but Slinkus, you're lying to me because I know that it also knows things like asset reference and core object and color and things like that. And yes, it does because those are basically elaborate collections of these three things with um, also kind of another thing, right, which is that it also has functions, which are, you know, collections of codes given a label. And so that's also there too. Um, and so what we can do is ba all of these things come down to saving information about that. Like an ID is ultimately a string, right? And we know that things like the player's position is in a vector three. Um, and let me just pull up some vector three so we can look at that for a second. Um, vector three. So vector three sounds fancy, but actually what it is is three numbers, one that is the X, one that is the Y, and one that is the Z. So you could, there's like lots of times where I could just like treat this separately. I could be like, here's an X, here's a Y, here's a Z. But sometimes it's useful to just like, all right, just take my X, Y, Z package, right? Because the player always has an X and a Y and a Z, right? And put it all together and that's the vector three. Um, so sounds complicated, very useful. Um, and there's like a weird thing, which is let's look at colors. What are colors at the end of the day? Colors are, let me see if I can see. Yeah. Okay. So colors are three numbers. They are R, G, and B with the possibility of A, which is the alpha, which is like how transparent it is or how transparent it isn't. Um, and, um, uh, but look at this, you could actually put a vector three in to create a new color. Um, because a vector three 
is three numbers and a color is three numbers. So if I just wanted to just like save three numbers for that, I could do that. Um, and I've kind of skipped ahead to what I wanted to talk about, which is like, what is, let's see if I can find the core object, what a core object is, right? And so like I was saying earlier, core objects are a collection of these different data types put together with expected things that it's supposed to have. And the expected things that it's supposed to have are properties and functions. Okay. So basically when I make, all right, when core, the Manticore people made these core objects for us, right? They gave them certain properties and they thought, okay, like, so what is the things that people need to be able to know about and need to be able to change about an object? Um, those are events. We're going to skip events and we're going to start with, Ooh. Do they have properties? Ooh, we got there. Okay, so we're gonna start with the properties. And if you look at this return type category, at the most part, it is a string. Um, enum is uh, kind of a complicated thing, but an enum at the end of the day is sort of a number. Um, and um, Boolean, right, for bool bool for Boolean, numbers and strings. It really comes down to these little bits of information that we, um, yeah, sorry, light theme, I know. It's blinding because so much of what I have switches between them. Um, but um, I look at light theme because it's what everybody's going to see first. So if I'm working on documentation, got to go to light theme. If you, friends, are trying to figure out how to turn this off, there is a button. Whoop. Did I just lie? Where's the toggle button? Is it just because I made this too big? Uh, there's the GitHub there. Where's the theme toggle? Is it down here? Ah, here it is. Okay, see? Joop, joop. And then refresh, I believe. Nope. There it is. Okay. Don't know why it didn't work. So this is, this is how you get to... Uh, Dark theme and light theme, if you haven't done that yet. Um, yeah, it is It is sneaky down there. Um, I'm going to actually, I, this is, I think it's, I look better, like my screen looks better on dark. Um, so I guess we'll just stick with that for now for consistency's sake. Um, but um, where were we? Core object. Uh, core, let's see, I can find it on the side here. Sorry, I'm trying to make everything big and readable, and we're trying to find its properties. So these properties are, for the most part, they're either these types that I talked about, or um, enum is a little complicated, so I'm going to skip that for right now, or they're another core object. And there's no other, like, all of the other objects are actually also core objects. So that means that all of these core objects should have a name, an ID, whether or not they have a parent, right, this can be nil. And I talked about last time, nil is like, we haven't said what this is yet. It's nothingness. Um, and um, they all have visibility, collision, enabled, static, client only, server only. And if I look at, if I go back to core, and I'm looking at, let's say, default floor, and I look at its properties, wow, look at this. Collision, um, Visibility, I don't know if enabled is in here, um, but there's lots of different, basically, like, is that, that might be in, might be visible, I don't know, I don't actually know what enabled means, so let's, let's look at it. Um, is enabled, turn the object and its children off completely. Okay, yeah, I guess that's a code thing. So not all of them are going to show up in the properties. Um, and if you check out, I just redid, we've got our like build your first game. And I just made a new version of it for the last team standing framework and the like idea of building a Valorant game. There's a couple things you need to change. And one of the weird things is that jump is something that if I go into player settings, it's a player setting, I could turn it on and off whether or not the player can jump and in a Valorant game, they can't so I turned it off. Um, it also makes map design way easier. Um, and, um, uh, my cat is attacking me. Okay. Um, so, but can mount is another property of a player. We'll go back up to this. I'm kind of skipping around a little bit guys. Um, but there's a lot to talk about here and we're going to continue going over it. So next Tuesday, both at 6 a.m. my time, 9 a.m. Eastern on the inside participate Twitch channel. Um, and at 11 a.m. Pacific, which is 2 p.m. Eastern, um, we'll be on the, uh, 
uh, to be on this channel, and we're going to be doing just more kind of intro to Lua things, and I think I'm going to back it up and go over some stuff. Actually, I think w the plan with that was to focus on triggers, um, because they're like the most useful thing, and you could build an entire game out of them. Um, so you should check them out. But if I look at player, I can't remember what we were, what property we were going to find in player. Oh, can mount. Are these not in alphabetical order? Can mount. Okay, right here. Um, this, you can't actually toggle on and off in player settings. This is something that you can do with code. And so we did a really, really simple script to just say, anytime a player connects, set them can mount equals false. Done. Easy. You removed mounts from the game. Congratulations. It doesn't make sense in a lot of contexts to be able to have a hoverboard. It's awesome. But, you know, running around like a core plaza or something with hoverboards, like 100% enhances the experience. Um, and, um, and so there are, there are things you can change with code that you can't just change through the interface. So that's one of the reasons to learn code. But basically what I want to get to is this idea that everything has these properties. And then, okay, so we talked about this return type, right? And this is ultimately what it is. So if I say player.name, Right, if I say print player.name, we're going to do this example now. And the way we're going to do it without a on connect script is we're going to make a local script. So I think this will work. Create a new script, um, player, local player. Okay. Um, and so I hope I. It didn't create. What did I? Did I press enter weirdly? Player script. There's not a reason you need to write script in all of your player scripts. I find it a little bit easier just in case I need to search for it here. What is... Oh! <laughs> it is because I was still in preview mode and did not notice that. Um, so, in a previous game editing context, the amount of time I spent making changes while I was in preview mode and not realizing it, and then it erasing everything I did, was numerous. Okay, so we're going to take player script, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to put it in the uh, create network context containing this client context, right? So this is basically, I want it to run on each player's side of their computer, but not on the server. And you can get different things with the context, and that is not the subject of today. We're just going to kind of gloss over it. Um, client context. Okay, I don't know. All right, that's what it was already called, so I'm not sure what we achieved here. So if this is in client context, I should be able to say local player equals work. Uh, let's find out what get local player is the child of before I make a mistake here. Get local game dot get local player. OK, and you'll see this is tagged client only. Right. And it's because on the local side, on the client side, I have a local player. It's the player that's playing. It's on their side. Right. This won't know about other players. There's only one local player and it's whoever is running the game on their side. And so it's client only. The server doesn't know which one is the local player because none of them are local players to the server. Um, they're just all foreign players. Um, so we're going to grab this um, and I'm just going to copy it and we're going to put it in the stream and we're going to say local is game dot get local player and then we're going to print player. Okay, so let's try this. Everything is going to be fine, and it's going to work right away. Um, and it says, capital P, player, right? And the capital P is not a coincidence. What it gave you is that it's getting back a player type of thing. That thing is a player. It didn't say me anything about it. If I want to get more information, right, I know things. There are different properties of players. Um... So all of these properties are things I could ask it about, right? I could say name, ID, team, animation stance, hit points, kills, deaths, right? These are both, these are both numbers, right? Um, and um, you'll see integer, integer is also a number. I mean, I don't know if number always means float. Um, probably, actually. Um, but integer is just specifically like you can't have half a kill. Um, there was a list of core types and documentation. Ah, uh, there 
are. I mean, in that, like, uh, if everything, basically, all of these core Lua types, this lists literally all of them. This is it. This is all the ones there are. These namespaces, I... I might get to that at the end and like what that means but you can basically kind of imagine that like a type you just can't create this core makes the game for you you don't make the game um number is literally all number types yeah i'm just wondering because like <sighs> there isn't there is and there isn't an int type in lua right but what's happening is that we're writing in Lua and that's turning into C++ and C++ there definitely is an int type. Um, and I was talking to Chris who does the advanced Lua classes um, or some of the advanced Lua classes on Tuesday at four or at two, uh, Tuesday, on Tuesday at four, I think. Um, and that is, um, and that there, Lua actually does the whole time think of these as different things. It just does a bunch of fancy converting things in between them, which is hilariously kind and accommodating for something that has no string methods. Um, but that's, uh, that is a discussion for a different day. So I could literally put any of these properties and we're going to do dot name because it's like the most obvious one that's unique to me and i use a dot to access it and i say name so this says whatever player it is which is going to be of course the local player so it's always going to be me print the player's name so we'll save that we'll go back to core um and see this is how i always end up in half mode now you know um press play and it says core slinkus which is me if i had a name plate on you would also see that above my head i am core slinkus and that is the correct name so that's how you access a property now i'm saying access and what i really mean is what i want to do is get the value i want to in computer science speak read that value um so that's how we get to this column over here which is sort of confusingly named tags because it's telling us different things right it's telling us that client server side thing and then this thing called read write versus read only um so if something is read only right like the id i can't change it i can find out what it is and that's actually very useful right just to be able to read things um and then some of the things i can write so this says here name is read write so what I could do is I could say player.name. I can change that. And I've never actually tried this, but let's assume I, it works just fine. I'm going to say player.name equals, we're going to use my roller derby name, Disastronaut. Yeah, I know. Very clever. All right, so we'll save that. And then I'm going to go into here and press play. Um, attempted to access a server only field. Oops. All right. So I missed that tiny part of it, which is that it's server only. All right. I didn't actually see that. Oh, we've moved. Um, back to player. Uh, did it say server only? So some things are like sort of kind of server only and it's hard to explain exactly what's going on, but, uh, yeah, see, in this case, what we're doing here, and this would actually be a great, this is a little bit fancy. So this is not using local players. This is getting all of the players in a like normal context. Um, so it counts the number of players that there are um, and um, is getting their names, their IDs, and their teams. But it's not trying to change any of them. One of the things that I do have experience changing, um, because if you have teams, I forget what the default value is, but if you have like teams one and two, what I have found, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong about this, um, hi, Fake Zombie Craft. I started a little bit while ago, but I rambled a bit. So what we're talking about is core objects and what they have. Um, and so, so far, I've just been talking about properties. So this is a script that's running on the client side. So it's only looking at whoever is on my side, um, which is me. Um, and we're just talking about properties of player, which is, in this case, the name. Um, and I'm going to try a different one, which is player.team. Because um, you'll see that if I print player.team, I cannot set it to disastronaut. And it kind of makes sense. I don't actually want to change my player's names. It was sort of a weird thing to be read, right? I just want to test it. But um, is that by default, if you have teams enabled, I believe it starts... So I don't have teams enabled right now. I'd need a team settings object to do that. But it starts, when you have teams enabled, it starts the first two people on team two. And I have not seen any exception to that. Um, 
I could be wrong because I am also mostly thinking about when I test this with the client context with the like multiplayer testing preview mode. Um, and so it could be that it behaves differently in an actual game. But if you want to decide what team is everybody is on and not just have them randomly sorted, um, then you have to actually assign that. So we're going to see that right now, because I don't have teams enabled, my player should be either team zero or one. We're going to find out. This might be invalid with my current team settings, uh, which has made me fall through the floor before. There's so many exciting things. Um, and you can see it's a very tiny warning there, but it said that the script is updated. So I know it had my changes. Um, player access to server only. Okay. So I'm basically, because I made this client side, it's really not liking me trying to change any of this stuff, which totally makes sense. Um, and can I clear this? All right, stop. Still doesn't like something near my name. Oh, cause I just like never, did I never update this? Okay. Yeah. So it just doesn't like me changing this on in the client context, which is sort of like a weird thing. All right. So we're going to do, we're going to create a player script that does that same loop that we were just talking about that goes the well that fires for every player when they connect. Okay. So we're going to say, um, create a script and use the script generator for the very useful player join leave. And if you're interested in this, you should check out, sorry, I'm in preview mode. So this is not going to work. Um, uh, all players. Um, if you're interested in this, we're using it a couple of different times in the um, Valorant course on Core Academy. So I'm going to just show you guys that because I'm actually really proud of this. I mean, I'm always really proud of it. Um, but uh, boom, doesn't look good in half mode. Okay. So I need to re change this name. Oops, I forgot about that. Okay. So if you go to, because these, we make these ourselves. They're not like generated from the courses. Um, anyway, so we need Deathmatch to Valorant. Uh, I also changed that name. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Everything is, I think I might have old cash going on here because this is not the new course. What is happening to me? All right, let's just see what happens if I do zero to Valorant. All right, so yeah, this is the course that I was looking for and you should be able to find it. I'll put this link specifically in the chat. Um, is yeah, I need to make it networked, but I'm not gonna be able to use get local players. So I'm just gonna make a completely different script, fake zombie. But yes, that's like literally, it's exactly what's happening. Um, okay, so um, we just added basically a new version of my first game. So like probably a lot of you made like your first game and you made a deathmatch game and you customized the arena and that's like, everyone's gotta do it, right? You've gotta learn this. And this is like a different version of this, but we're really focusing on the Valorant thing. So first thing we do is we disable, uh, disable jumping, right? Which is, whew, that is really, really blurry. Wow. Okay, I don't know why that one is. All right, this is fixable. But anyway, it's you uncheck the is enabled under jump and I can show you in real things. And then to disable mounting by contest, we have to create this player join leave script. So you can check this all out. Um, it's the opposite for you. Wh which one is the opposite? Um, Oh, you started to experiment like right away. Yeah, I'm totally, I'm totally with you. The first thing I tried to build in core was a skate park. Um, and, um, and so I just like spent forever. It's really just like my roller derby game is the same thing of just like basically trying to play with sp player settings to make it feel skating, um, skatey, um, become the flash. Hell yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's, you know, the flash is one of my favorite superheroes because I am very slow. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, playing with like player settings and stuff like that is really awesome. And this is the script will let you change players. So I used this on last Friday. We used it to take the ability that we made in Valorant and just give it to the players right away. Um, and that's like one of the useful things is if say your game has this like preset set of abilities, you don't want to sit there giving them an equipment to pick up cause they might miss it and then they need it. You can just go in here and basically anything that you do inside of each of the of this function in particular will be applied to the player as soon as they join 
Um, so yeah, check this out if you want to take this apart. All we do in this whole script is say player.camount equals false. That's it. There's no reason you even need on player left or to bind to it. Um, it's just in the generated script, which we're going to look at now. Um, so project content, my scripts, we have all players is this new one. So now we're going to do these things with all players, right? And if I press play right now, I've still got some errors with the player script. We're just going to delete the old one. We don't need it. Goodbye. You did you did great work being a demo. Stop. Still in preview mode. I used to get out of that so much more quickly. I don't know why things are changing. Okay, anyway. So now if I press play and I have the event log open, nil. Must be from something else. And escape. Yeah, it doesn't actually tell me what the source is. Print to-do list. Oh, well, there's no to-do list to find. Okay, so it's still doing this thing. We don't actually need this thing either. So I'm going to take that out. And I just didn't put my all players thing in here. So delete core content, uh, project content, my scripts, all players. We're going to drag that in here. And now, now, friends, if I press play, it says player joined, course link is, and when I stop it, it says player left, course link is. So, hello, Carbide Core. Welcome. I am here to teach Lua. We're talking about object properties today, um, and I will be continuing to do introductory to Lua um, during the Core Academy Gen Ed streams for a little while we're building this course so it's kind of a subject that's on our minds and there's lots of little subtopics so today we're just talking about objects object properties and god willing i will get to um object methods um which are uh, yeah and events we're actually sort of implicitly doing. So what I want to do now is we could print a bunch of player things. So we could print player.name, for example, things like that. But now let's see. <laughs> Maybe I have to network this. I want to say player.name equals disaster or not. So let's see if it works now. Yeah, player join, disaster or not. So let's just, for funsies, get a name tag. Name plate. Throw that guy in, and I don't think I have to do anything with that besides throw it in, which, like, by the way, on your games, you should just, like, go ahead and throw in name plates. There's a lot of customizations available, um, but it's just, like, really nice to be able to see who's there. Um, yes, Lu Lua Fu. Lua. No, I don't want to sound problematic. Lua Fu um is what we are going to be working on but you can see now this is not my name my name is course linkus my username is course linkus but it has been changed to disaster not um and for my roller derby dream i had a dream game i had a dream where you add your roller derby name and that is what displays instead of um your regular core name which might be the same thing and you can keep it maybe we can even make it populate your name so you can decide if you want to change it or not but you can see i can change that and the way the script works is now every single person um is going to be um disaster not um we could we could do it uh eh, we'll see if that's what it happens uh we connect and if i look we only need to look at one of these screens because we should both be in the same place. But now I've got a multiplayer preview. And I'm Disastronaut. They're Disastronaut. We are all Disastronaut. Hey. Um, so, yeah. So that's not um, a super... Cancel. That is not a super useful thing to do. Oh, this is still going. Man, I'm bad at stopping previews all of a sudden. Um, but, yeah, like uh, Junster is saying right now, what we're talking about is some things like the ID I cannot change, right? That is called read-only. I can find out what it is. And um, I think I saw in community content something like... It was something Fear the Dev made uh that was like so that you can be like the mod on your thing and probably right in order to figure out if it's you you're gonna need to check your id um and so being able to read a player's id and see if it matches something that you've already saved very useful right can't change it though if you could change it it would be a problem right then you know you wouldn't have consistency in that 
Um, and so there are reasons. Um, and then, um, so, but if something is read write, that means I can change it and I can change it just like a variable. So the way I change the name is I said, if I just want player.name like this, I just say player.name. And if I want to change it, I say player.name equals, and then I give it the correct type. So if we look here, the return type is string. So it needed to be a string. If I said the number two, it would probably break. Um, I don't know if it has string conversions. There's like ways you can say like, okay, two, and then just make it the string of the numbers that are there. Um, but I don't think it's going to do that for me automatically. So let's just press play to, te oh, we're still in multiplayer preview. So we got to get spin up multiple server. Um, are there any mods in uh, chat right now? Um, Okay, uh, I will address that in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, it broke. It didn't apply the thing. And probably when I go back to this core, this one here, I'm so bad at alt tabbing and press stop. And I look at my event log, it's going to see expected string received number. And we know exactly what's going on there, um, which is that... Um, uh, yeah, uh, that, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, the point is, is that we know what's exactly what's happening. We, it wanted a string. We gave it a number. That was the experiment that we did. And it gave us a really helpful message telling us exactly what we expected. So a lot of times you're going to see this expected something receive something else. And you got to think, okay, so that's probably inputs into something. Um, we are working on Dirt Magician. We are working on saving streams. Um, they, you know, they stay on Twitch for a little while and we're just kind of trying to make a pipeline to get them onto our YouTube. Um, it's just, you know, you sit here and I've been talking for like an hour and I ramble about things and stuff like that. And when I want to make a YouTube video, we're trying to be like, this is the information you need. And we're not going to do a lot of like, you know, humming and hawing and talking about how you can change animated mesh his hair colors to be light blue even though it's super dope um so um yeah that's the reason that they're not over there things but we're basically we're going to be moving them more and more we just need to do it um so yeah um but, uh, yeah, so um, where was I? So we were talking about players and we we're talking about um, properties, right? And being read and re read and write and having types. Um, so this is all really fun stuff, but let's get into what's even cooler, which is, give me my API, which is the methods. Um, and they are written here as functions, and I'm going to keep accidentally saying methods. It's a whole thing, but we mean the same thing. So we're talking about stuff now that the player can do. So this is like properties are properties of a player. They are things that things it already has, like whether or not it can mount. That's just that when you made a player, it had values for that. Boom done they might be false they might be nil but it just set all of those up so that you could do player dot that and every player you'll be able to do dot those and it will exist um methods are stuff the player can do and that's a little bit misleading because sometimes it's like stuff you can make the player do and sometimes it's um stuff you can find out about the player um and so uh we do like add impulse right um, and so this literally is just going to like shrimp the player in a direction and you can see it takes as an input here, um, a vector three. Um, and you know, I've been trying to use move, move two, and what I needed was add impulse this whole time. Um, and so it's going to need a vector three cause it's going to need to know a direction. And in order to do that, it's going to need an X and a Y and a Z, right? Um, so, um, so it, you couldn't just be like add impulse and then be nothing. That just wouldn't do anything. But things like, uh, I'm trying to get another one, apply damage, right? Just adds damage to a player. I'm pretty sure, I can't remember how I did it, but in community content, I made this thing called damage zone. 
Um, and you can find it. It's called Damage Zone. And it was just to test your, like, HP bars and stuff like that. Because if you use a kill zone, it kills the player without actually changing their HP. So it looks like your player bar is, like, not doing anything. Um, so if you want to see it slowly go down, um, we'll just import this bad boy. Yes, of course. Save project content. Double click you. Double click you. Drag you in, and it's there. And they use the skull just to like denote where it is. There's probably like a bunch more elegant ways to do it. Um, but oh, I keep forgetting to turn off a multiplayer preview. All right. Well, here we are. And if I go in here, I the nameplate actually gave me this. So. Oh yeah. To make it go multiple times, you have to re-enter the trigger. And then you die. Super useful. I know. But the way this does is literally calls whatever player enters the trigger. Um, and says apply damage. And then applies damage. And if you look at it, we can actually take this apart. Um, stop this. Um, and if we look at the damage zone, it's literally just like a trigger with the skull. Which hopefully has... Uh, collision disabled yeah it's, you know it's kind of kind of clients i don't know anyway and we've got a script called damager and if we open this guy up we'll see that literally all it does is it takes this trigger event which events i was going to talk about more on tuesday um but and then basically other is the player right and we know that it is the player because we did this test with this is a and player and so is a is something you can do with i think all core objects um and then supply it a string of the type that you're looking for and then this code only goes if other is a player so we can see now because we know that we can use a player method and the player method that we're using is called apply damage um and then here we had to make a damage object because that's another type of object and the amount is actually a custom property so we can look at the thing here and we could say damage amount is 20 so i can make it 100 which it's basically you should think of these as a percent um because the default on players is 100 so now oh my gosh i've got to turn that off i'm just gonna do it now we're done we're done with this mm. Stop. No players. Okay. Now I press play and uh, and now I press play and run over there. Expected string received number. I was still mad about that one thing. And it just instantly killed me. And so basically it looked for this custom property. Custom properties is also a different topic. Sorry guys. I'm jumping around a lot today. Everything in core is really like connected into things. Am I planning to do a Q&A stream someday? You have some questions, but don't want to interrupt the broadcast theme. First of all, go ahead. Feel free to interrupt me. And I'm going to be doing beginner Lua stuff Tuesdays and Thursdays every week. So you're totally welcome to, um, you know, jump in, ask questions, any of that. Um, and then... Q&A stream, I can set one up. We don't have one planned um, just because it's, you know, it's, you, you don't know with questions if you're going to get enough to fill the whole time. So you just kind of want to have a theme anyway. But if you have questions that you want specifically covered, what I would suggest is go to the core discord, the core creator discord. Um, and there's a core Academy channel in there. And if you post questions in there, then I will give them full explanations here. And if I don't know the answers, I will ask people who do. So we can get you the questions you have. And if you have something that you're thinking of right now, I'm happy to just see if I happen to know it. Um, I've jumped around a lot today. So, um, cause it's very hard to kind of do the beginning stuff. But what I wanted is this central idea of these are methods. And when I call a method, I use a colon. Um, so we're going to go back to the all players script and we're, we're going to fix this player dot name thing. Cause we don't like that. Um, I'm going to take this out and actually let's just, I'm going to delete this. So we're just going to do something for when the player joined and not worry about this. And I actually don't want this comment anymore either. Um, and this is an event, the player join, and that is like the third part of these things. So if you get into the core API, you'll see all of these core Lua types have three sections and they're in alphabetical order. So the first one you see is event. After that is function. And then finally is property. And now in terms of like when you would use these, I would actually do these in reverse order, but alphabetical makes sense. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> I do usually jump around. It's true. Core is exciting, and there's so much stuff in it. Um, but we try to get through the essential topics, and I appreciate your your support, Daddyo. That it means it means a lot to me. Um, not as much as the suggestion that you would use the San Francisco house in Granny's Got Back. That meant the most to me. I just that's. That's that's how you know you made the big time. It's when your community content gets there. Although finding my milk crate in uh, the fishing update of um, f- Core Farm Game was like the greatest. Um, yes, I made the crate. It is it is it is my finest work. Um, and yes, any of you who have fished have probably found it. I had to spend so much time miss fishing fish to finally get the milk crate i mean it was like an hour of my life just spent messing up catching fish because i've got a backpack of like one so i couldn't even keep them anyway um and i just wanted to see the milk crate um but okay sorry back to topic just so we get the essential concepts that i want these are properties if they are read only you cannot change them but you can find out what they are and you can write your code based on what that is if they are read write you can also use that dot name or dot whatever the property name equals to change it and it's that simple however right this is a weird thing because you're basically reading and then writing, right? And that is kind of the same thing as getting and setting, which you'll find here. So these are also properties, or these are methods, um, but getting is basically reading and setting is writing. So they actually do almost the exact same thing. And the big difference is, is that usually these aren't simple core types, right? So if I've got something like a vector three, I really want to say like set and use a method to supply a vector so that I can do on the other side, do a bunch of checks to make sure it's the right type and not break it. If I'm using that dot, it's probably something simple like a string. Um, so get means tell me what it is, right? Um, and set means change it. So let's, let's see if we can, I don't know, that, that one might be a little bit, but like, uh, we could do a tick. That's a little more complicated than I want. Um, let's do player get abilities. So we got player and I can say just player here because pl- this function gives me whatever player connected. And we're going to say player get abilities and what this if we look at what get abilities gives us it's an array which is actually in lua a table um but the types we have here tend to be the c plus plus types not the lua types it's a thing we could fix it um but it's going to give me a table and a list of abilities um and we need to print this so that it actually does anything so we'll say print player get abilities and then we're going to do something else, which I think will work, which is player get uh, colon get abilities. And the important takeaway here is if I am calling a method, I always need parentheses after it, whether or not there's anything inside of them. So if I were trying to say set velocity, I would need to have a vector three inside of the parentheses. If I'm not setting anything, right, if I'm just getting velocity, I still need those parentheses because it's actually a function. It's just a function that can only be called on a player. Um, and so this hashtag is like the super fancy Lua thing that tells you how long a table, which is an array, you know, is, is a list of things, how long it is. Um, so this may not work, but I'm going to try it. And so we're going to do this. We're going to stop. It says that it updated the script all players and I forgot to open the event log and the event log, the first thing it said was table and that it gave me a long number, which is probably the ID of the table. And then the second thing it said is zero and you just have to take my word for it because it's very small. But if I like copy and paste this into Visual Studio, we can see that the output was first it said table and then it said zero. So awesome. We got exactly what we were expecting. Um, Oh, nice. I have not gotten the rubber duck yet. That is awesome. Um, But yeah, isn't it just there's a special something to find a model that you made in core covered in slime and given to you for failing the fishing minigame. It's just it's it's a really beautiful sensation that makes you feel like you have succeeded. Um, So. What we know now is that when I use a get, I'm going to, it's going to do the same thing as the return. So I could make a variable for it. I could say 
local player abilities equals player get abilities. And again, because it's a method, and you can tell the method because they're capital letters, I use a colon to access it um, and empty parentheses because you don't supply anything, right? Um, and I don't think there is a set abilities. And then here I'm just going to print, we're going to change this to player abilities. And this is going to be hashtag Octothorpe player abilities. Okay, so we'll do that and nothing changes. It looks exactly the same. It says table and zero because we didn't change anything. Just an interesting thing to keep in mind is when you use get, you can assign it to a variable and leave it, use it later. Um, and that is the end of my time today. So your takeaway from this is check out the core API. Look at all of these things and just start looking at the objects that they have. So like if you've created equipment, you know, you can do that all drag and drop. Um, you can now access these different variables. So try to write a script. Um, we'll talk about events on Tuesday. Uh, we'll talk about events next Friday um, and kind of like what they mean and the power of them and so that you can fully understand this. But for right now, your homework, yeah, that's right. If you didn't know there would be homework, but there is, is pick a core object and start looking at the properties and functions, right, that you can learn about them. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, you didn't know, but you're here, so I expect to see, now, if you find something cool, definitely post about it in Core Academy Discord, or on Twitter, you can use hashtag Core Academy, yeah, that's right, I'm also at Sarah Slinkus, um, on Twitter, if you want to tweet me, I love to see anything that people are learning from Core Academy, it's awesome, um, and it makes me feel like I'm making a difference, which is huge, um, and it's been nice, thank you guys for being such awesome participants, and I will see you on Tuesday, don't forget to check out Mr. Isaac's, um, Inside Participate, twitch.tv slash Inside Participate at 9 a.m., Eastern and 6 a.m. my time, which I have not seen 6 a.m. in a long time, actually since last time I did a stream with Mr. Isaacs. Um, so it's going to be really exciting, um, and I will probably be speaking more slowly. So you have that to look forward to. Thank you guys again. It's been awesome.